Welcome, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kids of all ages, to Star Talk Radio. Bill Nye here, sitting in for Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I'm here today with none other than Chuck Nice. Hey, Bill. And we are going to have cosmic queries. Yes, we are. Questions from the cosmos submitted by you to Chuck. And Chuck, you not only have the questions, you have what they want to look like. That's right, I do. What they want to look like, because these are their avatars from Facebook and uh, Twitter and what have you. And we have uh, questions from all over the internet, wherever we uh, find a home. And um, uh, now, before, before you go any further, go ahead. I just want to point out that we are excited to have GE as a partner for this inaugural video, Cosmic Queries. Head over to their YouTube page to check out videos of how they are bringing imagination to life. I'm talking about www.youtube.com slash GE. Yes. <laughs> we have a query. <clears throat> yes, we do. Let's jump right into this and go to Justin Connors, who's uh, coming to us via Facebook. And Justin says this. Since Mars core cooled off much faster than Earth because of its higher surface area, wouldn't it have had a much earlier start than that of Earth. That is to say, how much sooner could Mars have been habitable than Earth? Also, what kind of period of time could Mars have had to develop and sustain life, and could you compare that to Earth? So, so, so... It, it, Can we... First of all, this is a fabulous question. It is a great question. And let me say, uh, he worded it as best as he could, but it's that... It's not just that Mars has... Uh, it's not that Mars has more surface area. It has more surface area relative to its mass. It's gotcha. a smaller thing. It has about, about as much surface area as the land of the Earth, the dry land of the Earth. Okay. And so the number that I s hear people work with quite a bit for Mars is 4 billion years ago. It would have cooled off enough to have liquid water running around on Mars. Okay. So that would be, pick a number. Ha a billion or half a billion years before the Earth, so maybe it is just not. A, it's not crazy, but it's extraordinary to say that life started on Mars. Mm. Mars was hit with an impactor about three billion years ago. Stuff got tossed off into space <laughs> through Hohmann orbits. A little mathematical fabulous thing. Uh, these rocks with living things in them landed on Earth, and oh. you and I are descendants from from those Martians. particular microbes. So we are really Martians. It it's could possible. be. It could be. But well, I'll tell you it. what. Tell you what it is. Okay. It is worth finding out. It is worth mounting a human mission to Mars mm -hmm. to go look for signs of water and life. Gotcha. If we were to discover evidence of life on Mars, on that other world, mm -hmm. it would utterly change this one. In the same way astronomy has humbled us through the ages, Right. we found out that we go around the sun, not the other way around. Right. We find out that planets are, if I may, a dime a dozen, maybe even cheaper than that. Maybe. And so we are no big deal. Our star is no, our sun is no big deal star-wise. Right. And maybe life happens all the time. It would be worth knowing. As they say, your world is getting smaller and smaller, and you didn't even know it. Uh, I didn't write this joke. It's a good one. Go ahead. It may be a small world, but I wouldn't want to have to paint it. <laughs> so, uh, okay, that's really actually a great question and uh, pretty fascinating stuff. Let me ask you about the Mars rover, though, as an addendum to this question. Uh, the when, Curiosity rover. The Curiosity rover. Because there's Opportunity Spirit and Sojourner. But right now we've got right. uh, Opportunity running and curiosity. curiosity. Take it. Okay. So uh, have they been able uh, to determine whether or not there's been any, not life, of course, but uh, rivers, streams, yeah. things of that nature? What place used to be very wet. Okay. And uh, the Curiosity rover uh, landed in essentially a stream bed. It's gotcha. crazy. You see these rocks embedded in what was ancient mud that right. solidified into rock. And, uh, and then Opportunity stumbled or rolled up to a layer of gypsum. This is the rock that looks that you make wallboard out of. Right. And it is a mineral that only shows up when things are really wet, like clays. Mm -hmm. And so geologists, you know, they just can't get enough. They're of going crazy they're, they're over out of their minds. Oh. But what we want to do is go to some place if I may, even more interesting. But to get to such an interesting place, you have to be able to land more accurately. The places we land, these rovers are wide open spaces right, so that course. we can not crash very much. Right. Yeah, because those are some expensive stuff. With and let me tell you something, okay? 
Opportunity curiosity together about three and a half billion dollars. Right. Spirit. They're not even locked. <laughs> okay, anybody could just walk up to those rovers. It's weird. You think we somebody's the up key. there with the, the club keys are or... in them. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. just sitting there with yeah. the keys. Yes. They're, they're virtually bait cars, is <laughs> yeah. what they are. That's what I'm saying. They're like virtually bait Surprised cars. Surprised the wheels are still on them after all this time. <laughs> All right, let's move on. <laughs> uh, here's another one from Scott. Scott wants to know. Oh, sorry, sorry. Nope. Scott, forget, Scott, you're forget, gone. Sorry, Scott. I'm not doing Scott. I'm doing Doug McKenzie. Doug. And, and Doug wants to know this. I understand Doppler effect with sound. <laughs> but give light speed properties. How does it catch up or pull away from itself to create red and blue ships? Oh, it's fabulous. So here's the cool it's thing. another good question. It's a fabulous question. This is the great thing to grasp about the Doppler effect. And by the way, full disclosure, my brother still dreams of starting a band called Christian Doppler and the Effects. But <laughs> his first name's not Christian, so. Oh, well. Anyway, that aside. It's like Hootie and a Blowfish. <laughs> Yes. That's right. Uh, Darius uh, Rucker is actually Hootie. So tell your brother he could do that. Yeah, he, he's it's totally fine. It is crazy. Okay, with this said, here's the thing to grasp is the frequency is what changes, not the speed. Ah. So uh, it's a it's a fabulous subtle thing. When we do experiments on light to observe waves, we observe waves. Right. And when, uh, if you can show or accept that sound travels in waves, then you can, uh, by perfect analogy, you'll have light travel in waves and get the right answer. So as an object, like a star, moves away from us at extraordinary speeds, uh, dozens and hundreds of kilometers a second, it stretches the waves of light. And so they go to lower frequencies. And if you have trouble remembering this, I strongly encourage you just to do a little Latin. Ultra means beyond. Ultraviolet is beyond violet. Infra means below. Infra is below red. So the red is the longer wavelength, and blue and violet are the shorter wavelengths. Okay. So when you go faster and faster away, your wavelength is stretched out. The speed of light's the same. The wavelength is stretched, stretched out, out, and so the color, as we perceive it, the color changes. Fabulous question. That is really fantastic. So that's, I suppose that's where we get... Well, Ultraman. Who that's was, right. Ultraman, Ultraman was beyond man. Was beyond if man. the blinking light stops. That's right. I remind you, Ultraman may never rise again. <laughs> Hayata and the Science Patrol, Chuck and I will be back right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to Star Talk Radio. Bill Nye, guest hosting for our beloved Neil deGrasse Tyson. I am here with Chuck Nice. That's right. And you know what's cool, Chuck? What? Slow-mo. Slow Even cooler, super slow-mo. Head over to GE's YouTube channel and get a look at what GE's up to with their super hydrophobic materials and watch what it looks like when a T-1000 gets built. That's right. www.youtube.com slash GE. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. With that said, before the break, Chuck and I got off in a little Ultraman tangent. Yes. Now, Ultraman, for those of you unfamiliar... <laughs> It's a Japanese superhero. <laughs> yes, he is. And that he was Japanese was a big part of it. Yes, it was. Because he was fluent in karate. He was a giant guy. He was a he giant was guy. He was from the Science Patrol. He was from the Science Patrol. He would, well, Hayata was his civilian name, like our Clark Kent. Correct. Takes out his beta capsule. Correct. He would become Ultraman. And for some reason, Ultraman had a light that flashed on his chest. And uh, it was pretty every week, Chuck. There's a monster. Every week there was a monster. And just shows came you. from somewhere. From, from, from the from bottom the sea, of the sea, yes. somewhere. A monster Mountains, would appear. Yes. And Ultraman had to be called. It's very stressful. Yeah. And it shows you uh, <laughs> something about our deepest fears right. that the unknown and monsters are trouble. And I got to think it's related to the uh, Japanese islands' uh, tendency to have earthquakes. I that, thought it was the fact that we dropped a bomb on them. That was uh, uh, 100 million megatons. Well, it was about 30 kilotons. 30, 30 yeah. kilotons. And so I think this the monster thing goes back in Japanese culture way before Oh, uh, way that. before it? Way before us? And uh, okay. can I name the artist you dropped a bomb on me? Was it um, you dropped a bomb on me, and then you'd hear the bomb? 
Um, I want to say cool in the gang. No, no, yeah. no. Oh, we have my work God. to do. It's We've got the, work to do. It's on yeah, the tip yeah. of my tongue. Yeah. Gap band. Gap band. You dropped a bomb on me. Okay, <laughs> here we go. With that, another question. <laughs> a cosmic query, actually. Oh, man. This and just great. think what it was like uh, conducting warfare without aircraft. Now we can't imagine it. And no the can. whole world, as of this broadcast, the whole world is fascinated with whatever became of Malaysia Flight 370. Absolutely. Our fascination with flying is deep within us. And space flight is perhaps the ultimate expression of flying. I would agree. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, take one from Saeed, uh, who wants to know this. All right. Saeed. Saeed. Uh, and his last name is Roshan. Saeed Roshan wants to know this. Will the Earth ever increase or decrease in its size over life. Over its life. Over its life, not our I, life. Well, but. I got to think, yeah. Now, geologists, I'm sure, have pondered this question deeply. It's a question of ti ti timing. Time timing. <laughs> Will the sun expand and heat the earth before the earth has a chance to cool off? See, when you cool the metal of the inside of the earth, your nickel, your iron, your uh, molten earth core, right. are you going to, uh, you're going to shrink... But will the sun uh, come out here and hook and cook things up before that happens? I think the sun's going to beat us. As far as uh, cooling the earth off, I wouldn't worry about it. And let me remind you, one of the tremendous insights uh, into the nature of geology, the nature of our place in space, people wondered quite reasonably, how could you have evolution happen over three billion years? How could the earth stay hot as it seems to have uh, all this time. And you can tell the Earth's hot inside when you have a volcano. Absolutely. Which we have now and then. That and the way Venus looks at us lets us know we're hot. I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. I'm, I'm sure you're right, Chuck. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure you're right. I've always kind of had a thing for Venus myself. I don't blame you. But that said, uh, Venus stays really hot for other reasons. Anyway, the inside of the Earth has fission going on, mm -hmm. nuclear fission, and that keeps it really hot. But eventually, you would think, hypothetically, theoretically, things would cool off. But I think the sun's going to heat up and cook us before then. Venus stays hot because of all its carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is run away with the greenhouse effect. So, Venus, please, could, could that be our future? Is, w would you talk about the greenhouse effect? It's, could it be? No, I don't think so. Venus is so hot. How, How hot is it? Thank you. It's so hot that... Uh, the uh, ground, you would melt lead on the ground. You take your fishing weights, what? they would melt. Oh my your goodness. stainless steel cutlery would just well, just bend, uh, yield. And so furthermore... Like it, a Salvador Dali painting. It would be. Really? Uh, but you'd be dead to, before you could appreciate it, probably. <laughs> I mean, instantly. And then furthermore, it not only... Wait, wait, there's more. It rains acid rain. Wow, this sounds like an acid. environmental disaster, well, this Venus place. Venus is like hell. And the guys who did the first in the modern era, not the people from the 1700s and the early, 18, early 1900s, mm -hmm. in the modern era, the people who discovered climate change on Earth, uh, uh, Michael Mann to a lesser extent, but um, Jim Han James Hansen, okay. uh, June of 1980, 1983, All right. testified in front of Congress, uh, it was um, it was studying Venus, the atmosphere of Venus, with telescopes that people discovered the real the, the real effect effects of, of, of too much carbon gases. dioxide. Too much carbon dioxide. Wow, wow! And by too much, we're talking about just a little bit too much. Just a little, just yeah. a little bit. And that's all we need here is just a little bit. That's too right. Much. And it's yes. game over. Yes, but I think it's going to happen even if I whisper about it. <laughs> Chuck, we have another query. I just <laughs> oh, <the, clears throat> you know I'm laughing because we do have a tendency to do that when something's bad. We, we have a tendency to whisper like that. That's yes. gonna make it okay. But I remind you, right. the Earth can still hear you. <laughs> We're now over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. There you go. Even if you whisper about it, it's still gonna happen. So All right, on. let's. Let's move on to Matt Milligan, and uh, this is what Matt wants to know. Why does the light from stars go on for billions of light years, but the light from my flashlight 
will only go two feet. Oh no! Oh, it does What's go. Up it does. With that? Good question. But first of all, let's remind us: the light year is a unit of distance, not a unit of right. time. Right. Not a unit of right. It's time, speed of light times time. And just if you want to do and that units, gets you the distance. If you and by the way, everybody, if you're out there having trouble with your distance equals rate times time problems, just relax. Just look at the units. If you're going meters per second times seconds, you're going to get meters. If you're going miles per hour times hours, you're going to get miles. Cheer, it's happy. Speed of light times years, you get a long way. <laughs> a light year. Right. All right. Now your flashlight. It, I used to sit on the beach, particularly, mm -hmm. and sometimes the forest, and shoot the light straight up, the flashlight straight up. And wonder if there was somebody else out there on another planet, pick one, Rigel 12. Rigel 12. Uh, who's doing the same thing. Here, it's it would, lovely in the spring, by the way. Uh, on Ry it could be, That's with right. the Rigelians. And uh, <laughs> is there some, a Rigelian out there shooting her or his flashlight back at me? And yes, the photons do go on forever. It's just they get so dim, your eyes can't detect them. Now, in a room where you shine your light around, that light will get absorbed by your quilt. Gotcha. In your bedroom. Gotcha. Even the paint of your walls uh, is absorbed. What if you set up mirrors everywhere on all the walls and you turn on the light? Would it bounce around forever? No. Even at 99.99999%, at the speed of light, things bounce around very quickly and, and it's all absorbed. And it's all absorbed. Turned into heat. Okay. Sorry, man. Re-radiated in another form of light. But uh, in general, um, so it's still there. Away. It's just kind of uh, energy it's just, doesn't go energy away. Energy doesn't man. go away. It's, doesn't go it's away, still man. there. It's just like, hey, baby, this is what I am now. Gotcha. Uh, in those terms, <laughs> I might have been. I'm very scientific. Might have, that might have been how the Gap Band would have expressed it. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, people from that era. From that era. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. <laughs> I'm just something else now. I'm just. All right. I'm just an energy man. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. <clears throat> Why? You know, <laughs> at, you know, we really don't have to. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, wow. This is a question directly for you. Okay, let me see. Okay, I think we might have enough time. Hey, Bill. Matt here, student at Sacramento State University, California. Sac State. There you go. When we see an object of light away from us, we are seeing it in a year in the past. Okay. Oh, an object of light year from us, we're seeing it a year in the past. Okay. Right. A uh, reasonable way of reckoning. That's a reasonable way of reckoning. Okay. Theoretically, if we are able to grow a tree, say five light years tall, with the aid of a telescope, would we be able to see the different ages of the tree as we look at its farthest branches? Say, for example, the tree begins to die near the ground, uh, blah, blah, blah. So the short so. answer is no, Okay. because you can only see it at the speed of light. In other words, you can't detect that it's dying out there on the end of its five light year away branch right? unless you're looking at the light bouncing off the branch. So along this line, another interesting thing to interestingly think about. You say you're looking at light on distant stars. What's ever happened there has already happened. Right. Be that as it may, it hasn't happened here yet gotcha. until the light gets here. Right. And this gets into this thing of information theory. Like, Does it really... Although the thing landed on Mars 11 minutes ago, it hasn't landed on Mars here until the light gets here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> we will discuss this further right after this. Welcome back to Star Talk Radio. Bill Nye here, guest hosting, if I can use that verb for Neil deGrasse Tyson. And people, check me out because I'm with Chuck Nice. Yes. And it is Fabulous. <laughs> I don't think he's going to change his name. Not going to change my name. To Fabulous. Not to Fabulous. But he could. That's no, what I'm saying. No, nah, that sounds too much like a rapper. As you know, my Chuck, name. Chuck, Chuck Fabulous. Fabulous. What does Chuck Nice sound like? You, you know what? <laughs> a wimp. That's what it sounds like, <laughs> young <much>. man. <laughs> Certainly. He's no, nice. No one is afraid of Chuck nice. nice, that is for sure. And they should be. <laughs> this guy will cut you. <laughs> It's good, though. It's good. Oh, that's great. Chuck, Cosmic Queries, your queries yes. from the electric interweb that yeah. the kids are using. Yes. Very happy that you all took the time to write to us. And your questions, this show especially, have been just outstanding. We Chuck, really have had some great we, we questions. We have another one, I take You know, before we go on to the next question, very quickly, um, I just, because we were, we, you didn't finish this because we had to come back for the break, but we were talking the break very quickly about, uh, I said, I think that we're so science averse oh. in our country because there's certain people 
who benefit from that because they have it gives them power. It gives them power. It gives them power. I mean, that's just my own personal opinion. And so this is especially true of military hardware. Okay. Historically, this these scientists have been pressed into service. You know, Galileo, uh, I guess Fraunhofer uh, was pressed into service in science, uh, in the military, using science in the military, making these extraordinary lenses and stuff. With that said, science democratizes knowledge. And I, Chuck, uh, this may mean this more to me than it should, but it doesn't matter who shows you the earth goes around the sun. True. The man does not control who, what makes the earth goes around the sun. <laughs> Science is true for everybody. True. Science <laughs> is, is knowledge outside of us. Science is as near as we can tell. What we hope to find in science are rules or laws or, thing, or ways of looking at things that are true everywhere in the universe. doesn't matter where you're from, your ethnic background, how much money your ancestors made. The man does not control the facts of science. There and you that go. is an elegant, beautiful thing. So you and I and uh, the regular host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> are working to change the world. So everybody listening to the broadcast right now, Turn it up loud as we take another Cosmic Query. Fantastic. That was outstanding, sir. Let's move on. Uh, Jerry Yitzi Sandberg wants to know this. Uh, if you could bore to the center of the Earth and not get burned to a cinder, <laughs> let's, trick, suspend, a trick, some, a let's thing. suspend some disbelief here, and hollow out a sphere in the, in the geometric center of the Earth, how would gravity affect you then? So, oh, it's cool. There'd be no gravity. So, so you'd be zero G? Zero G. So what we recommend to you all is... Uh, Get take, yourself a drill. Well, take physics. <laughs> take physics. And uh, a classic physics problem, which is every bit as much fun as what you just described, yeah. is drilling a hole, a hypothetically imaginary hole, through the center of the Earth... And then you uh, big enough for pick an enchanting object, a bowling ball, okay, and drop it through the hole in the center of the Earth. What happens as you get the, as the ball goes all the way through and then comes out the and other it comes side? Comes out the other side. What happens? Uh, Does it shoot off into space? No, it falls it back. Falls through, back through over and, and over and no over air, with no aerodynamic drag and right. not bring burn to a cinder. Right. And this is a fabulous <laughs> problem. And wait, wait, there's more. I'm a mechanical engineer, and as I like to add, I'm also human. I'm a mechanical engineer, and one of my uh, really satisfying technical jobs was working on this navigation system for drill bits. This would be the technology that is the ancestor of modern fracking drills, no kidding, where you can guide the drill, mm -hmm. uh, steer it underground. Okay. With extraordinary precision. Like when they had this oil well leak in the Gulf of in Mexico the Gulf, right, and they had to right. come in sideways. You can guide drill bits very accurately. And the moment you start going down inside the earth, mm -hmm. there's less gravity. Wow. Do, 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 do. And these were detected by our accelerometers. This was at a company called Sunstrand Data Control, which is now part of Honeywell. And these accelerometers, or excels, because we're so cool, these excels... Uh, would detect micro G's, millionths of a millionths G. Millionths of a G. And so when you have a shell of material, this is a mathematical shell of material above you, right. it all cancels out. Wow. And so to those of you listening who have not taken physics and have not tried this math problem, right. I encourage you to do it. It's a, these are both just outstanding, cool, insightful math, math problems that would come to us really from the discoveries made by Isaac Newton. What? What? Do where, where, where were you when I was taking physics in school? I don't know, man. Man. Physics, it is all, it is all science is either physics or stamp collecting. <laughs> but that turns out, that's from a different era. It turns out now life science is so fantastically complicated yeah. that it kind of overwhelms physics, much as I love my physics. Take it. Uh, right. Sorry, I digress. Okay, Imagine you know me what? Digressing. We have a minute left in this segment. So I got Derek Wilson here who has a really cool question. Uh, I think I know why he's asking this. <clears throat> How accurate is carbon dating really? Very accurate. And the, the longer, the least long time ago or it was, the better, more accurately it is. <laughs> this is to <laughs> See, say. That's what I was about to say. I think he's asking. So this. here's how it works right. is carbon 14 is formed in the air when you are a living thing and you stop breathing or stop 
transpiring if you're a plant. Mm -hmm. The carbon-14 changes to nitrogen and then uh, took back then down to carbon-12. And so the moment you die or stop breathing, this uh, process happens. The carbon-14 doesn't get refreshed. Right. And so it's extraordinarily accurate. But do not confuse carbon-14 dating with how we've determined the age of the ancient dinosaurs. Exactly. That's potassium argon and uranium uranium. And rubidium strontium will be back after this. Welcome back to Star Talk Radio. Bill Nye here, guest hosting for Neil deGrasse Tyson. And wait, wait, there's more, everybody. I'm not here by myself. No, no, I'm here with Chuck Nice. That's right. And it's, good to be it's, here, too. It's all that. It is. It it's is. so good to have you here, Chuck. Oh, man, we're having a blast. I'm having what are a we doing time. today? We are taking what? Cosmic queries. These are queries. From the internet. Well, from the cosmos, Chuck. They are from the cosmos but, via the internet. Yes. They are. Precisely. Indeed. And uh, we have uh, quite a few people who've actually um, written in to uh, ask specific questions of you, Bill. Uh, I wow. know that people got a lot of free time out there. <laughs> <laughs> I know because they're saying, hey, Bill. You know, like Will Burke, who wants to know this. Are there any locations in the solar system that you think we should focus more on sending a mission? What benefit would we gain from doing so? Well, we at the Planetary Society, the world's largest non-governmental space interest organization advancing space science and exploration for the betterment of humankind, where we want everyone on Earth to know the cosmos and our place within it. That planetary society encourages missions to all these worlds, Enceladus, moon of Saturn that has it seems to have an ocean, right. and Europa, which has got an ocean. We want to go to Titan, where there are tides of methane and ethane, these uh, natural gas kind of liquids. They're liquid because it's so crazy cold. Smells like a fragrant trip. Uh, and we would put sniffers on them, by the way. <laughs> And just to go on, as far as, just keep in mind, if we were to discover evidence of life on one of these worlds, like Europa or Enceladus or Mars, it would change this world, utterly change this world. It would change the way everybody felt about what it is to be alive in the universe, alive True. in the cosmos. It would change us. And you know what else we'd discover? What? Nobody knows. That's why we're going to go send missions to find stuff. If we send missions out there, we will make discoveries and... We will have an adventure, an adventure shared by all humankind. If you talk to kids, what do they, and you say, what's your favorite planet? They often, not so much as they used to, thanks to Neil, they'll say, Pluto. That's so true. Pluto. <laughs> thanks to well, Neil. Well, tell you what, 2015, there is a mission going by Pluto, New Horizons. It left in 2006. I was there at Cape Canaveral going, the, it's the fastest rocket anybody's ever built. And we'll get to Pluto nine years later in 2015, and we will make discoveries that will change things. Furthermore, when you invest in these missions, Chuck, yes, you solve problems that have never been solved before. So true. So planetary science is what NASA does best right now. Yeah. And NASA is the world's largest space agency by a factor of three. So that is planetary science, the line item within NASA, which is in turn a line item within the federal budget, which is in turn a economic entity in the world, that's where we'd invest to innovate and keep the United States in the economic game. <sighs> Next question. Awesome answer, sir. All right. <clears throat> uh, J.D. Prevost wants to know this. If a planet had a slower axis rotation allowing the star in its orbiting, it, that it's orbiting to heat the planet over a longer day, so bigger planet, yeah. Heat, heat, heat along. Could a planet be further out of what we consider the habitable zone and still sustain life at similar temperatures as Earth? So bigger planet, farther out, longer day. Well, let's, do, let's, do all those things factor into? Let's back up. The yeah. Earth day used to be before we had clocks. As far as it used to be, eighteen hours in the ancient dinosaur days. So that's a fact. That's like thirty percent. That the Earth is going a third slower than it used to. I did not know that. And we're here. We're alive. So you got to figure if you're farther out and turning slowly, if conditions are right, you could be a living thing. You got to. Why not? Who's to stop you? Wait, wait. There's more. The planet Mercury spins two thirds of a time for every orbit, mm -hmm. and I don't think there are any Mercurians because it's too close <laughs> to the sun, from what we understand. Right. But there's ice. 
in the craters of Mercury. Is there some place on some other world that's turning slowly, that has some slush, and there's living things in it? I, I don't know. Right. One way to find to make sure we never find out is to stay here. Not go looking. And not go looking. Exactly. Wow. That is very cool. That is, hey, hey, JD, number one, great question. And number two, who knew that the Earth Day used to be 18 hours? Well, that's what you talk to the ancient dinosaurs, take a meeting with them. <laughs> well, really, they're the fossil ferns that are extant that are along with their fossils. Okay. You can infer a lot about uh, the ancient environment. And then you look at silts and uh, mm -hmm, ice right. and things, and you can f infer a lot about the, how the Earth is slowing down now mm -hmm. caused by tidal friction with the moon. And you can work backwards to how fast it must have been spinning in ancient times. Meanwhile, we've got to spin on out to a break. Hey, hey, Bill Nye here, guest hosting for my beloved, my good friend, Neil deGrasse Tyson, here on Star Talk Radio. I don't want you to be jealous. Yes, I'm here with Chuck Nice. <laughs> and he is all that, ladies. He is nice. <laughs> now, Chuck, we had a question right before the break. Yes, we did. And R.T. Feely wanted to know, um, climate, climate change deniers drive me crazy. How can we convince them that the data is real and not some kind of scam? Well, here's the thing about the scam. Uh, conspiracy theories are lazy. Uh, Wouldn't it be nice if there were someone in charge screwing things up on purpose? <laughs> But actually, things are screwed up just sort of by accident. we got 7 billion people living on a planet where the atmosphere is just this thick. Right. If you could drive straight up on some crazy road with some crazy car, you'd be in outer space in an hour and a half. The way people drive in New York, you'd be there in uh, 40, yeah, maybe 45, about 45, 45, 45 minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, conspiracy theories are, are not very good explanations for things, especially something as complicated as climate change. I encourage you to read the hockey stick. Uh, by uh, Michael Mann. <laughs> Full disclosure, paperback version, I wrote the foreword. Now, Chuck, <laughs> it's time for the lightning round. Yes, it is. You have the bell there, and uh, what we are going to do is we are going to zip through these questions as quickly as possible. Let you me can... remind you. Go ahead. This installment of the lightning round is powered by our good friends over at GE. You should head over to their YouTube page and take a quick look at some of the cool things they're doing. Quick, right after this segment, www.youtube.com slash GE. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the, micro, to the uh, lightning round. And there you go. Let's start with Rachel Pomeroy at Rachel Palm. She wants to know this. We know some things can be ignited with light. Can anything be ignited with sound? Oh yeah, really? Sure. What? You get it to uh, you get it vibrating at its natural frequency. And if you if it's something that's going to fatigue, yeah. you ever try to straighten out a paperclip and it gets right. warm? Just, it gets hot. Take a rubber band, stretch it, stretch it, stretch it. It's it hot. gets hot. You can get it hot enough to burn. Whoa, that was awesome. All right, this is at uh, Corbin Bonspod. Okay, this is Daniel. Is his name? And he actually sent this to you because you're at Science Guy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he wants to know at Science Guy. Here we go. Oh, crap. Here we go. Here really? We go. That's a question? <laughs> I, Chuck lost, Fine. I lost the question on my Chuck tablet. Fine crap. <laughs> Here we yeah, go. We Let's got go. It. We got it. <laughs> he actually sent this to you because you're at Science Guy, right? Yes. Okay, here we go. Uh, could we build a space elevator to the moon's pole from the Earth's pole? A oh, space elevator. Uh, very difficult business because the moon is going around the earth it's orbiting although because uh even though it has a little woo, 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 vibration it say it faces the same face to us it's an eigen value if you're scoring along with us a proper value so it rotates once while uh, every month so you're going to have to have a pivot you're going to have to have something like uh, a cowboy's wrist oh, with right. his lasso excellent uh, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, yes, it's no. Uh, this one is from At One Guilty Pleasure. Also for you. This is straight to you, Bill. Um, is it possible that dark matter is the excrement of a black hole? He's being funny, but I know what he's asking. Uh, yeah, it's it could pretty be. funny. It could be. The, the, what, uh, things that fall into a black hole right. come out of another part of the universe at another time. Right. Have they been modified, the things that fall in? Have the has the stuff turned into dark stuff? Right. Has it become comprised of darkons? Darkons. Awesome. 
So the answer is maybe. 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 A clear maybe. That's right. Okay. Let's um let's go. It's on. lightning, Chuck. Let's go. <laughs> let's people. go. Here we go. Um, this one is from Mark. Um, and he wants to know this. Can we protect a spaceship with an artificial magnetic field the same way it's around our Earth? Hypothetically. People talk about this quite a bit quite a bit. If you had a huge power source, by power I mean electricity power source, some reactor with a Stirling engine and a generator out there on your spacecraft, you could maybe make a magnetic field so powerful that you would deflect uh, solar uh, the solar wind and all those uh, particles and uh, cosmic rays that could uh, maybe not cosmic rays, the things that could cause you trouble. All the radiation. Could be the radiation could be deflected around your ship. Ah. Uh, so the answer is Yes. Yes. Number one, shields up. Okay, this one from at- Shield four is buckling. So. <laughs> Shield four is always trouble. Lead on. Uh, this is from at Laura Lee Biology. Um, can Bill comment on Hawking's new claims regarding event horizons? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's apparently he's uh, things that fall into black holes- may not come out at another part of the universe at another time. You may be a way to get the energy back. That's the way I understand the paper. Gotcha. And she asked, can I comment? I did. I, <laughs> ignorantly. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. This one from at CJ Robinson wants to know this. Uh, what would happen to our atmosphere <gasps> if gravity was turned off for one minute? So no gravity on Earth for one minute. What would the effects be? We remind you, uh, inertia is a property of matter. So I guess if we turned off the gravity for a minute, the uh, everything would continue to spin through space for a while. But then you'd start getting a lot of outgassing, random uh, collisions. The atmosphere would be warmer than space, so those molecules would bounce off each other and disappear forever. Whoa. Okay, so we're running out of time. We're down to the wire. This is from Scott Avion, and he wants to know, what advice can you give a new science teacher from K-12 to trying to really engage their children in ex and get them excited about sciences? Oh, that's a fabulous question. Chuck, what was your favorite thing about your favorite teachers? Uh, they made me want to learn. They made They're me passionate. They're passionate. They're yes. passionate. So, uh, Guy, what's his name? Uh, Scott. Scott! Let your passion come through. And we'll see you next time on Star Talk Radio. I'm here with Chuck Nice, and we have had nothing but fun. Thanks for listening. The left arm.